designing modern board games. And today, Lecture 21A, Sample Turns for Stalingrad, and incorporating elements from my books, Stalingrad for Beginners, Stalingrad Replayed, now available at Amazon Kindle and Smashwords.com. For a full description of how to play the game, read Stalingrad for Beginners. For more tactical analysis, read Stalingrad Replayed, both available from Amazon.com on Kindle. Good morning. Today we're going to discuss a short but complete game of Stalingrad. What we see here is the Russian opening move. We're looking only at the section of the map near Finland, so I can expand the map so you can see very clearly what's going on. The Russians have set up, as they are allowed to do anywhere on their side of the border, and they are in fact here, 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 and here. They are right up against the border. The Germans on their setup and first move on their setup must start at least one square back from the border. So they could start along the 34 file. They could start at F33. They could start at I30 or J29. They could not, however, start at H32 because H32 is adjacent to the Russian border and the Germans aren't allowed to start there. The Germans then move. When the Germans do move, there is a limit to how far east they could move. They could, of course, move around inside Finland because they run into obstacles. The red line along here and down to here and through here shows the limit of the possible German advance. They may not choose to move there, but they could. A German unit starting on I-30 could move due east to I-31 or southeast to J-30. It could not move northeast to H-31 because H-31 is a lake square. When the German unit reached this square, I-31 or J-30, it would have to stop because it had entered a Russian zone of control. And when you move a unit into an enemy zone of control, you must bring it to a stop. Similarly, up here in the north, the Germans could move up to all of the squares with red lines in them, but what they entered any one of them with one of their units, the unit that entered that square would have to stop because it had moved to a square in a Russian zone of control. Observe that the Russians have a solid line with no holes in it. On the other hand, if these two Russian units on B-37, B-36, excuse me, had not been there, uh, Gee, the Germans could start here and they could move due east and get into all sorts of mischief back in this part of the board. However, that's not what the Ger Russians did. The Russians have this nice solid line, B36, D36, G34, J31, so the Germans are contained in Finland. Here we see the Russian opening position on the central front. The Russians have set up, as they are allowed to do, anywhere adjacent to the border or behind it. This unit's well back from the border. These units are well back from the border. The Russians have set up in such a way that from the Baltic Sea to the Hungarian border at the other end of the map, they have present a solid line of zones of control stretching across the front. The solid line Oh, there's a gap down here, isn't there? We'll get to that in a moment. The solid line is indicated by the red line running along the Namunas River, down this way through Poland next to Warsaw, up to the Bug River, around along the San River, and gee, now we stop and something else happens. On the FF and GG file, the Germans have the restraint that they must begin one square back from the border, say FF9 or GG9. However, their maximum movement rate through mountains is one square per turn. So on their first turn, no matter what they do, they can advance no farther than GG10 or FF10 indicated by the blue stars. 
The Russians have attempted to arrange their position as much as possible so their units cannot be attacked at three to one. Of course, there are con constraints under which when can you be attacked at three to one, when can you not? The two two three sixes sitting in the open can be attacked from all of these adjoining squares and will be surely attacked at seven to one and destroyed. The two three six here faces a modest challenge for the attacker. The attacker has two choices. The attacker can attack from DD13, DD12, and EE11, in which case the units on DD13 undouble the 236. The 236 is defended by the San River on two squares, but if the Germans attack from DD13, they can undouble the 236, so it has three defense factors instead of six. The penalty that the Germans must pay if they make this decision is that there's, this creates a limitation on their motion and advance. If the Ru Germans only attack from DD12 and EE11, the two river squares, the 236 is doubled. After the German attack, which the Germans are certain to win if they attack at reasonable odds, the Germans would then be allowed to advance across the river onto EE12. And because they were, had moved across the river to EE12, the Russians would not then be able to set up a delaying unit here on FF12 because there'd be a German stack next to it. The Russians would have to attack to move into FF12. On the rest of the board, for example here, or here, or here, the Russians have set up a position that is three to one proof. That is that the Germans cannot attack at three to one. Why are the other positions three to one proof? The basic rules issue is that the Germans can only stack three units high and therefore, and all of these units are either behind a river, in which case they're doubled, or they're sitting in the city of Brest-Litovsk, in which case they're doubled. The Germans have a constraint. Because they only have units of a certain strength and can only stack too high, they need six units to attack a doubled 574 at 3 to 1. They need nine units to attack a doubled 7104 at 3 to 1. However, if we look at S18 here, there are two 7104s on the same square. The Germans could pile up three, six, nine units against S18. However, if they were going to attack one 7104 at high odds and soak off on the other 7104, they would have only eight units available for the, the high odds attack. Attacking at high odds is nice, but if they only have eight units, the best attack they could get is a two to one. Ditto, all of the five, seven, four stacks, there are in fact three of them here, can be attacked only from two squares. Well, this unit can only be attacked from one square because, gee, the Germans can't get to DD14. The Germans must start back here, they move here, they move here, they have entered the zone of control of the second armor, the 236, and here they must stop. They cannot move to here this turn. To attack a doubled 574 at 3 to 1, the Germans need to use 6 units. At 3 units per square, they'd need 2 squares to make the attack from. However, once they've used the six units, say three and three here, to attack the 14th infantry at three to one, they have nothing left over to attack the other two five seven fours in the stack. The best they could do, this is not a good idea, is to attack one of the five seven fours at three to one, excuse me, at two to one, and soak off on the other two five seven fours. Well, this sounds very impressive, but two to one is a somewhat risky attack. So we have now looked at the Russian defense in the central front. We are now looking at the Russian opening positions on the southern front. The Russians have chosen to defend along the length of the river behind the river so that their units are doubled. The Russians have a variety of other options on where, where they could begin 
and open their play. For example, they could certainly have occupied JJ12 with this stack. That stack would have been doubled on the mountains. Uh, some players prefer to start out on the Prut River or to occupy NN13 so as to block German moves out of Romania into this extended panhandle area. Uh, notice the Germans are required to start one square back from the Soviet Axis border, that's this black line. So in this area the Germans could start on LL12 or MM13, but not on NN12. They could start on OO12 though. Having started on LL12 or on OO12, what could they do? Well, if they had six speed units on OO11, they could move one, two, three, four, five to JJ13, take a one square rail move to JJ12, and if it was a six speed unit they were moving, they could move one square through the mountains to II12. They'd, at, when they reached II12, they would have had to stop. Notice the Germans could not continue into JJ11 Hungary because the Germans are not allowed to enter Hungary on the first turn. Uh, the Russians have attempted to set things up with the available units to make their front as strong as possible. The Russians, however, cannot be indestructible everywhere. The best they can do is to set up to be in reasonably good shape against a German attack. Uh, observe it's worthwhile to point out that the Russian units here cannot be made three to one proof because these depending behind a river are four six fours uh, well except for this fellow and because they are weaker units and this fellow can be hit from four squares if the Germans want to put enough units down there for example three eight eight sixes and two six six sixes the Germans could attack here take a three to one on one of the four six fours make a soak off say a four 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 against the two units that would be a four two remembering these are doubled 24, 4 to 24, 1 to 6, a 3 to 1 attack, and the 3 to 1 attack would be sure to win. Uh, the hazard of the 3 to 1 attack may, um, is that you get an exchange, and now the German stacks are somewhat weaker, and replacements will appear in Warsaw on the other front. The Russians have done what they can with the available resources. They had alternatives. Once again, the red line indicates the limit of the German advances. Um, if you're clever, you realize that even HH12 really is not accessible to the Germans. The Germans can only get to II12 by using the fact that they can move along here and then either move along the railroad or take a rail bonus to there and get one square off into the mountains. That is the best the Germans can do. If the Germans don't attack, they can all, they're not required to attack, they can also just sit there and stare at the Russians and remind themselves that they're tying up three, six, nine, eleven Russian units. Here we see the German opening their June 1941 move as it takes place in Finland. The Germans are allowed to place a maximum of eight defense factors of non-Finnish units in Finland, they chose to put into Finland two units, namely a 336 Panzer Grenadier Division Corps and a 554 Infantry Corps. There are a wide variety of other variations as to what the Germans might put into Finland, ranging from an 886 German Armored Corps down to, or maybe I should say over to, four Romanian 224s. The net result of all this, no matter what the Germans send to Finland, is that the maximum German strength in Finland is 22 combat factors. The Germans are not allowed to start adjacent to the Finnish border, but they can start one square back from it, and that's exactly what you see here with stacks on B34, on D34, on F33, and on I-30. Observe that the Germans have placed their units so it is impossible for the Russians to surround them. 
if the infantry corps that were here on F-33 had instead been placed on E-34, the Russians could have advanced to D-35 and advanced to F-33, so we have Russian here, Russian here, German in the middle, and the German units in the middle would have been pinned in place and subject to being attacked without retreat. The Germans have been careful to avoid this fate. We now turn to the German moves in the center. The German f advances in the center are split in half by the Pripyat marshes off the map towards the um, upper right corner. So we split the germ images of the Germans in half. We are now looking at the northern central front. The Germans don't really have any great attacking opportunities, so they take high odds attacks on the 15th Armored Corps and on the 7th Armored Corps. These units are both uh, two three sixes. They are attacked at odds of G, 21 combat factors of Germans, to three defense factors of Russian, that's a seven to one. The units are immediately removed from the board. Here we see the German move in the south center. The German has moved aggressively to take availability of adjoining territory without, however, launching low odds attacks in order to advance his position. In particular, we see here that the German is attacking this 236 unit. Uh, the German is attacking it with six units on the river squares of the San River. The 236 is doubled on defense and is worth six. The Germans are worth a total of 42 combat factors, so that is a 42 to 6 or 7 to 1. The 236 is eliminated, and the German is entitled to advance to occupy the square. The German advances the three 886s along the railroad. Uh, the other German choice would have been to advance this stack that way. However, the German faces a technical issue that does not improve for long into the game, namely the German lateral rail communications north to south are extremely poor. A unit here can move two squares to the railroad, can move along the railroad through Warsaw for a bit, but if it wants to get all the way north over to Riga, it has to use land to move several times. And this is a matter that the German simply doesn't have very good lateral communications. The communications will improve when the German has gotten across the Bug River and has take, uh, captured Brest-Litovsk, then the German can move sideways very slightly better. Uh, the German location indicated B has also advanced into, across the mountains. The point of the advance across the mountains, um, given that EE12 here has fallen to the Germans, the benefit the German gets out of it is to have units where they can, for example, advance next turn to GG11 to support an attack uh, against GG12. However, once again, the Russians are seeing Germans taking fairly conservative high odds attacks. The Germans did have one choice here. The Germans could have placed units on square A to undouble the 236. The 236 would still have died without needing as much armor to kill it. However, if the Germans had attacked from square A, the 236 would not have been doubled, and therefore the Russian units here would not have been entitled to advance after combat. Finally, we examine the German move against the Russian positions opposite Romania. The German has occupied the length of the Prut River line as indicated. He has made no effort to attack across the river, which with the available forces as seen here he could not do. In order to attack the 696, the German would need 54 combat factors in 8 units, which the German can do, and would have had to do a soak off against a 4. With the units as indicated, the German can in fact get 42 combat factors, enough for a 3 to 1 on a 574, and the 42 combat factors would be spread over, um, as it turns out, nine units, and therefore the German could not attack NN14 from three squares 
and make a soak off even if NN14 were only held by a 574. The German and Romanian units down here are waiting for turn 2, the end of Hungarian neutrality. When Hungarian neutrality ends, the units here can move across clear terrain onto the railroad, take a rail bonus out to anywhere along here, and then move off the railroad into rough terrain. Or for that matter, off the railroad into Romania. Um, the German did not try to capture II-12, which could be viewed as an oversight, since if the German were on II-12, uh, these units would be doubled when the next attacked, undoubled, I mean. On the other hand, given the Russian setup here, the Russian could have chosen to hold HH-12 or II-12, or for that matter, JJ-12, the Russian could have chosen to hold any of these against German attack, and on turn one, those positions would be secure. On turn two, when the German can move into Hungary, um, the Russian would have to realize JJ-12 can be surrounded, II-12 can be surrounded, HH-12 is the first position that the Germans could not surround if they were to attack it. Instead, the Russian has refused the central flank in this area and has pulled back a distance, leaving it for the Germans, if they wish to do so, um, to advance on turn two like this. Of course, what the Russians do on turn one still remains to be seen. Nonetheless, the, the Germans have placed a fairly weak force in Romania and have done no attacking here. We now reach the Russian June move. We are looking at the Russian June move in Finland. The Russians have chosen to move across the border of Finland and to attack the Finns. And what we see here are four attacks. These two four six sixes on a two two four, that's a four to one. A four on a three is a one to one. Two fives on a two is a 5 to 1, and a 5 on a 3 is a 1 to 1. The high odds attacks, the 4 to 1 and the 5 to 1, are calculated to kill two Finnish units. The low odds attacks, the two 1 to 1s, are calculated to be the Sokovs. That is, the Russians have moved here on C35. They are attacking the German units on D34. All units on D34 must be attacked at some odds, and so what the Russians are choosing to do is to attack one of the German units at high odds, 4 to 1, and in order to be able to do that, they attack the other German unit at low odds, 1 to 1. The attacks you see here are a bit hazardous in the following sense. The two low odds attacks, the two 1 to 1s, have a reasonable likelihood, 50%, of leading either to an attacker eliminated, which simply removes the attacking unit, or an exchange, in which case the Finnish unit is removed from the board, but it takes with it the attacking Russian unit. If the Russians had instead left one unit, say, on C36 to cover their flank, or perhaps even another square further back, and move the other two four four sixes over here, they could have made a five to one on one of the two Finnish units and a um, four to one on the um, other. So we have three fives attacking a three, that's a five to one and two fours attacking a two, that's a four to one, and they would not have had to make any low odds attacks. Uh, if they had instead rearranged by moving another unit up from the main front to occupy, say, here, they could have moved units around, and they could have pushed both of the attacks up to odds at which they were attacking at five to one or higher, and therefore would have been in no danger of losing a unit. 
they might still have they might still as they already are have been allowing the germans to advance out of finland but they would not have risked losing expectation somewhat over one unit in combat losses but that's a russian choice and you see what the results we'll see what the results are in a bit we now reach the russian june move we are looking at the russian june move in finland the russians have chosen to move across the border of finland and to attack the finns and what we see here are four attacks these two four six sixes on a two two four that's a four to one a four on a three is a one to one two fives on a two is a five to one and a five on a three is a one to one the high odds attacks the four to one and the five to one are calculated to kill two finnish units the low odds attacks the two one to ones are calculated to be the sokoffs that is the russians have moved here on c35 they're attacking the german units on d34 all units on d34 must be attacked at some odds and so what the russians are choosing to do is to attack one of the german units at high odds 4 to 1 and in order to be able to do that they attack the other german unit at low odds 1 to 1 the attacks you see here are a bit hazardous in the following sense the two low odds attacks the two 1 to 1s have a reasonable likelihood 50% of leading either to an attacker eliminated which simply removes the attacking unit or an exchange in which case the finnish unit is removed from the board but it takes with it the attacking russian unit if the russians had instead left one unit say on c36 to cover their flank or perhaps even another square further back and move the other two four four sixes over here they could have made a five to one on one of the two finnish units and a um, four to one on the um, other so we have three fives attacking a three that's a five to one and two fours attacking a two that's a four to one and they would not have had to make any low odds attacks uh, if they had instead rearranged by moving another unit up from the main front to occupy say here they could have moved units around and they could have pushed both of the attacks up to odds at which they were attacking at five to one or higher and therefore would have been in no danger of losing a unit they might still have they might still as they already are have been allowing the germans to advance out of finland but they would not have risked losing expectation somewhat over one unit in combat losses but that's a russian choice and you see what the results we'll see what the results are in a bit we now proceed to the german view of the russian position on the central front the russians have done as little as possible in response to the german move they put out one delaying unit the 466 seen here which does keep the germans from advancing through this gap in the russian lines uh... the um if the there had been no 466 here if the russians had not done that there would have been a hole in the russian lines through which the germans could have advanced and done all sorts of unpleasant things to the russian army however in point of fact there is the 466 here the russian position however has certain severe fault vulnerabilities the germans are able to attack at three to one odds here and three to one odds there even though the russian units are doubled why that's a five seven four defending it is holding three squares that it can be attacked from u nineteen v eighteen and w eighteen so the russians are able to attack this german unit from three squares and by attacking from three squares they um, are assured of being able to make a three to one of course if they do attack from three squares 
as indicated here, they would also have to soak off against one, two, three, four other doubled five, seven, fours. Those units are worth 28 defense factors. They're behind the river, the Namunas, so they're doubled, taking the defense value up to 56. Against 56 defense factors, the Russians would de be demanding that the Germans soak off with 10 attack factors of German units. If the Germans do want to attack with 10 attack factors, they're going to pay for a decision they made. The decision they made was to put no Romanian units on the central front. The Romanian units are all off to the south in Romania. If there had been Romanian units here, the Germans could have attacked, for example, with two four four fours and a Romanian two two four for ten attack factors. As it stands, it becomes complicated for actually it becomes impossible for the Germans to attack with exactly ten attack factors. They're going to have to attack with at least eleven. A, an unnecessary loss. Similarly, over here, these 574s can be attacked from one, two, three adjoining squares. And because they can be attacked from three adjoining squares, the R Germans are now able to make a three to one attack. Namely, they use up to eight of their attacking units to attack one of the 574s, a three to one. They use one of their units, or perhaps two, to attack the other two five seven fours at some low odds. That's a soak off, but by making that attack, they take the square. Or at least they end up next to the square with strong stacks here, here, and here, and the Russians have to figure out to counterattack. Note also that if the Germans attack AA 15, in a reasonable way, they will end up leaving units on BB14. And if the Germans have left units on BB14, the Russians cannot fall back from AA15 to BB15 and defend behind the river. They'd have to fall back to at least here. And this, this breaks the defense line of the Bug River. Finally, by attacking AA15, and leaving a unit on Z15, the Germans will be able to attack the 6 armor from here, here, and here. And there's a German unit here, which means there are German zones of control on Z16 and Y17, which in turn means that this Russian unit will be attacked with no retreat, and a 5 to 1 is sure to kill it. In addition, the Russians have decided to defend by leaving a stack of three, four, six, fours here. The Germans are then able to attack that stack frontally from FF12 and EE13. They can get high odds on one of the four, six, fours and soak off on the other two. And the plausible soak off, those are two, four, six, fours. They soak off with a four, four, four. That is a four, two, 6 plus 6 is 12, a 4 to 12, or 1 to 3. And in a 1 to 3 attack, two-thirds of the time, the Germans take no losses. So the Russians have presented a set of vulnerabilities, and the Germans have to decide how to attack them. Observe that the two 7104s here are 3 to 1 proof. They're on top of each other and can only be attacked from one square. However, because the German has occupied U18, you see the four infantry here on U18, the Russian cannot move from S18, the square where the 7104 is, and around one way or the other to get a, a 7104 onto V19, where it would 3 to 1 proof the V19 position. Uh, the German does not have an unlimited number of combat factors, and the German therefore has to make some sort of a decision as to where he is going to make his high odds attacks and where he is not. Uh, the choices are other than killing the six armor here, are a high odds attack here, a high odds attack here, and a high odds attack here. This would be the most expensive of the three to ones because you need a large soak off. The virtue of it, however, is that by leaving German units here and here, 
perhaps here on U19, and certainly here, the German would have a str strong stack on the Nemunas River, and the Russian would either have to counterattack against strong German units, or would have to concede that they had lost the line of the Namunas and would have to fall back a bit further. The, uh, the fall of the Namunas on turn two puts the Germans well ahead of any reasonable schedule. That's a good deal for the Germans. And now we're on the Prut River, the Russian June turn. Because we're at the Russian June turn, there's nothing in particular the Russians might want to do in terms of attacking across the Prut River into Romania. That river line is very heavily held. Uh, the Russians have simply thinned out their defense line here and done nothing else. The Russians might have chosen to occupy HH12 and GG12, which would protect the su their southern flank, or I should say really their western flank, against German units moving through here into Hungary and then on to HH-12 or II-12 or both. The Russians have chosen not to do this and therefore on the German move the Germans will be able to percolate across the Carpathian Mountains to II-12 or HH-12 uh, in preparation for a July advance against the Russian positions. However, the Russians basically, have, as I say, have done nothing but thin their line out. Forward to July you're now looking at the German defensive positions in Finland in July 1941 against the Russian attacks we just saw. You notice that there are only five Finnish units left on the map. That's because the Finns have lost a 224. On the other hand, we, if you count, you'll notice there are only six German units on the map. There was an exchange or an elim. One of the Finnish units was eliminated during the attack, uh, and therefore what the Finns have done and the Russians have done is to cause casualties on each other, and the Germans have withdrawn and are now holding fairly firmly one, two, three positions. The attacking Russian army is weaker than it was before because it took combat losses. Um, that makes it less able to conduct an attack. That's a price that the Russians have to pay for making those low-odds low attacks that we talked about. We now come to the German July turn on the Central Front. The German June moves were basically preliminaries, setting up positions that would allow the Germans to make serious and substantial attacks. Here we see those attacks taking place. The turn is also important because it illustrates the notion of soak-offs and concentrated attacks and dividing attacks against stacks. So we begin in the extreme north, the S file, nothing is happening. In fact, nothing at all happens until we get to the Russian 6th Armor, which is being attacked by 12, 24, plus 7 is 31 combat factors of German units on this square, this square, and this square. The Russian has a defense factor of 6, so this is combat is at 31 to 6, which reduces to 5 to 1. Uh, furthermore, the Russian has the modest inconvenience that there are German units parked here, and therefore squares A and B both contain German zones of control. In, contra in consequence, the Russian armored unit has no retreat. It is being attacked at combat odds where the only possible outcomes are DE, defender eliminated, and D back two, defender back two, but the defender has no way to retreat to, so the Russian unit is simply destroyed. Now we look over here. Uh, hiding under this stack of three Russian 574s is the Russian city of Brest-Litovsk. The Russian units are in a city, so they're doubled. The German is attacking from here, here, and here. The, but the German does something to divide his attack into two battles. He takes 1776 and uses it to attack two of the 574s. 
The sevens, five seven fours defend with their defense factors. They're in a city, so they're doubled. So this is a seven to twenty eight or one to four. However, the German has another attack. He is attacking with fourteen plus thirteen plus seventeen or forty four combat factors and he is attacking the last five seven four in the stack. That five seven four is also doubled, so this is a forty four to fourteen which reduces to three to one. Now you may say, gee, there's a river in here, isn't there? Yes, the river flows along here and here and here and here and there but the defender is not behind the river the defender is on the river so the defender the river has no effect on what the defender is doing so we have an, in this stack a 3 to 1 and a 1 to 4 a an expensive but affordable attack potentially expensive we should say and to soak off and once this attack has taken place the Russian really c cannot afford to counterattack to take to hold Brest-Litovsk. One might propose that the Germans would have been wise to take their heavier armored units here uh, or at least the 886 and put it over here so that the Russians would feel absolutely no temptation to attempt to counterattack to, to hold BB-15. I seriously doubt they'd do that, but you can always be more careful. Now we advance over to the end of the central front, and here there are six Russian units that are able to attack a stack of three Russian 4-6-4s. Four now the German could make this as one battle. It would be 19 plus 20 or 39 to 18, a 2 to 1. 2 to 1 is very risky. Part of the time the Germans will roll an attack or eliminate it and lose a good chunk of their army. So what the German has done instead is to say this 334 will attack the two four six fours, that's three to twelve at one to four. The German could also have used a four 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 in the attack. That would have been a four to twelve or one to three, and the likelihood of losing the unit would go down markedly. But the German has done what he has done. And so the three three four is attacking two of the four six fours in the stack. The third four six four must also be attacked. It is being attacked at sixteen plus twenty or thirty six to six, a six to one. Five six of the time at six to one, the four six four will be killed. One sixth of the time, it will, there will be a D back too. Also, if you notice here, there was a German unit on GG10, and it is pushed ahead to GG11, and the point of pushing ahead to GG11 is that the German has various opportunities for moving sideways, if he wishes to do so, into the, further into the Carpathians. Nonetheless, you have now seen the attack of the German army on the Central Front. In the south, the German is making an effort to outflank the Russian defense of the Prut River by moving his troops through the Carpathian Mountains. These are the Carpathian Mountains, the 11 and 12 files. What he has done is to use rail movement to relocate, and one square off rail, to relocate three Romanians to the indicated squares. He's also positioned some units on the 10 file. Now, the, the point of the Romanians is that in principle they could move from here to HH13 and if they join, are joined by German units here and here the German units would be attacking across the river the Romanian units would only be attacking along a river and would therefore undouble one or both of the Russian units sitting here and that would have the effect of allowing the German to make a high odds attack and penetrate this position there are however a, a, a couple of defects of the German move in particular these are very weak units uh, if the Russian parks on GG14, a pair of 574s, 
uh, that's 14 defense factors doubled is 28. The required soak off against 28 factors is at least 5 factors. 5 attack factors against 28 defense factors is a 1 to 6. And that would mean that the Romanians could move here, but all three of them would have to attack GG14, leaving no units free to attack the two Russian units and undouble them. One would reasonably propose that what the German should have done is to put strong stacks on HH12 and also on II12 and by doing that if the Russian sits here the German can still have lots of force to pile up on HH13 if necessary moves a strong soak off unit to GG13 if the Russian is clever he will notice what's she will notice what's going on and instead of staying here one of these units will fall back to GG14 where it's got a river in front of it. The other will fall over to II-15 right here, and you notice this has a river in front of it. Zone of control, zone of control, zone of control, zone of control, zone of control. That gives a solid line of zones of control across this side of the map, and if you look carefully at that, you'll notice that all of the units in the making those zones of control are doubled. Uh, the German would have to get some advantage out of having put strong stacks on these squares, namely if they're just 4-4-4s four, four, here and here. Uh, the Russian relocates, say, the 5-7-4 over to this position, and while the German has enough force to attack a 5-7-4 doubled at 3-1 to one from three squares, namely 5, 10, 14, 5, 10, 14, 6, 10, 14. He actually needs to have at least some 5, 5, 4s or the 6, 6, 6 on, for example, II 12, or the attack cannot be made in one turn. So there, it, there is some possibility of outflanking, but it's not quite as simple as it looks. The movement of the Romanian units to HH-12 shows a few interesting features of the interactions between rail movement and road movement. The Romanians began over here on MM-9. They moved to JJ-9 along the railroad and then one square off the railroad to HH-12. A move LL9, KK9, JJ10 to here would have required the Romanians to stop on entering this square because they would be entering a rough terrain square not along a railroad. What they instead did was to move to JJ9 and then move along the railroad and then cross only one rough terrain non-rail edge, this one, to get to HH12. Uh, there's a modest difference between the two units. The Romanian cavalry could have gone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, taking advantage of the fact that normal movement along a railroad through rough terrain is done at the normal movement rate. The Romanian infantry would have, however, have reached here and would have run out of movement factors before it got to HH12. So what it did, yellow line, is to move to here by normal movement, do rail movement to II11, and then use its last movement fat point to get off the railroad and reach HH12. The last move in today's discussion deals with the Russian July turn. In Finland, the Russian continues his attacks. There are three five seven fours. Well, one of them is a five seven six and a four six six, attacking a two and a three. That attack is being made as a single three to one. If the Russian had had another five seven, would have to be a five seven four in Finland. The attack could have been made at four to one, much more favorable odds with only a one-sixth rather than a one-third chance of an exchange. However, the Russian has made the commitment, is making the attack, and that is where the Russians are in Finland. Here we see the Russian July move, the northern half of the central front. 
The Russians had no real choice except to fall out of Brestotovsk, fall back, and fall back behind the line of the Namunas River. All of the Russian units, these, 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 and these, behind the Namunas River are doubled on defense. Because they're doubled on defense, it becomes expensive for the Germans to attack them. In fact, the Germans, if you look at what's left of the German army here, managed to lose in exchange. They lost 10 attack factors, driving the Russians, destroying one of the Russian defenders of Brest-Litovsk. They also managed to lose the unit making the Sokov, meaning they lost 17 attack factors. But in exchange, they, kept, they drove the Russians out of Brest-Litovsk. They broke the line of the Bug River at BB-15. The Russians have left behind this single isolated 464, whose function it is to sit there and die heroically, stopping the Rus Germans from moving further than Y-17, Z-16, or AA-16. The Germans do not have the option, even ignoring the possibility that the Russian units over here, of moving up through BB-16 to A-17 to surround the 464, because when the Germans move into BB-16, it's a rough terrain square, a swamp square. They're required to stop and no, move no farther this turn. So here is the Russian defense. It faces the same issue that the Russians have faced in the, uh, their prior turn, the June turn, namely the 574s sitting here are doubled, of course, but they can be attacked from three squares. And therefore, just as the Russian, Germ Russian lost Brest-Litovsk to a German 3 to 1, so the Russian can also lose V19 to another German 3 to 1. Is it worthwhile for the German to pay the soak off, given that he would have to soak off against three, four, six doubled five, seven, fours? That's 84 combat factors. The German would have to soak off at least 14 combat factors at one to six in order to make the attack. The German may say, this is a huge advance on my schedule. I should do it. The German may also say, I'm doing quite nicely down here. I'm several turns ahead of schedule. I don't have to take every three to one and pay lots of expenses when I can simply take advantage of the turns I've gained in my move. Here we see the remainder of the Russian July move. The Russians dropped a delaying unit, the 65th Infantry Corps, here. The purpose of this unit is to provide zones of control on BB-15, CC-14, and DD-14, so that Germans trying to advance off the top of the map have to stop on these squares because they enter a Russian zone of control and can move no further. The price for being a delaying unit is that the 65th Infantry will be at attacked at very high odds, almost certainly 7 to 1, and at 7 to 1 it will be removed from the map. Eventually there are Russian replacements, of course, but those replacements are some turns off. The 16th Infantry Corps, located here, is playing precisely the same role. Namely, it can be attacked from EE-14 or FF-13, or in principle GG-13. However, while it can be attacked from those squares, the um, presence of its zone of control on these squares means the Germans cannot go any further than EE-14, FF-13, or GG-13. So the German advance is stopped by the sacrifice of the 16th Infantry Corps. Now there are a couple of options that the Russians could have used that might have been interesting. One would be to say, we will take these two units and move them over to here. There is still a continuous line of zones of control along the Prut. We will then be able to take these two units, the 22nd, and move them to II-15, where they will supply a zone of control on these two river squares. Once we've done that, we can readily take these two units, and which are currently functioning to keep the Germans from moving straight along 
this axis, because they provide a zone of control on HH15, we can take these two units and move them to EE15. The purpose of putting units, German, Russian I mean units on EE15, and maybe a 7 and a 6 here, and a 7 and a 6 there, the purpose of having the units here is that now the Germans have to make a decision. If they want to attack the 16th Infantry Corps, they can attack it from FF13 only, and they do not need to make any um, soak off. However, they can only attack with three units, and the best they can do is roughly two eights and a four for a three to one, or three eight eight sixes for a four to one, but the four to one means that the four six four will die and take an eight eight six with it. If there are Russian units here and the Germans want to move into EE14, they have to pay the penalty, namely they have to soak off against them and lose a unit. Each time the Germans have to soak off and lose a unit, their army becomes just a bit weaker. The Germans do, however, have another option that is of some interest and would be of far more interest if the stack of units here were 444s or stronger instead of two two fours, namely the Germans could come out here, move on to GG thirteen, and join in the, usefully join in the attack on the sixteenth infantry. They'd have to pay an a soak off attack from say HH thirteen, which will cost them one four 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 attacking at one to six, but by moving the units to here on the Russian turn the Russians can't leave a delaying unit here unless it attacks because they're German units here already. And the Russians, instead of being able to delay on this square next turn, and perhaps this one, will have to fall back a bit further. Because the Russians are, did not defend here, uh, their chances of being able to use EE15 and GG14 as delaying squares have gone down a trifle. They could have rearranged things so their chances of hanging on uh, to this square and this square, or at least the use of those squares next turn, they could have arranged things so the chances of hanging on to those two squares was higher, but they did not do so.